So I'm going to be speaking about uh, eTurned, which is a BitTurned client written in Erlang. Um, I originally gave this talk, uh, more or less uh, this talk, about a year ago at the London Erlang factory. Um, so I thought that we have to do something completely different here. So essentially, uh, I'm going to be, have some overlap with that talk, but I'm trying to push in some new stuff so there's something uh, new uh, to, to, to listen to. Because otherwise, you could just go on the web, look at the, uh, look at the talk there, because it's online, and you would have the same talk. That wouldn't be fun, right? So what is it that we are doing with this peer-to-peer -peer thing? Well, we, I think that the most important part is that we are making each client a client and a server at the same time. So a client acts both as a client and a server at the same time. And that is essentially what is defining uh, this peer-to-peer -peer technology. And that means everybody is going to talk with everybody in a full mesh. And um, of course, that complicates things. Uh, essentially, my idea is that I'm betting that this is the future. I'm betting that after, we, after the cloud and after this centralized cloud, we'll see more and more services that try to pick up this idea where each client becomes part of the cloud or be becomes part of the server thing of the cloud by essentially having a small batch of all the data. So you're spreading data out in a distributed fashion among a large amount of, of things. And each thing is both a client and a server at the same time. So BitTurned is such a protocol. It's a protocol that allows you to distribute content in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So basically, whenever you have a consumer of content, he is also a producer or a pusher in the sense that he is actually um, in the game for distributing the content as well. Um, BitTrend is interesting because it, it's there, it works. So if you want to study these kinds of things, study these kinds of peer-to-peer -peer applications, well then, BitTrend is actually a pretty good thing to look at. And then, of course, yeah, a decentralized cloud would necessarily mean that we need to look into peer-to-peer -peer stuff. Um, so perhaps the easiest way to make a comparison between BitTurned and something else would be HTTP, simply because they are both about content distribution. I have a stream of bytes or an array of bytes, and I want to basically distribute that array of bytes. Or more generally, I have a resource. I want to distribute the resource. And what you can see here is that essentially, um, if you begin looking into it, BitTrend is the complete opposite of what HTTP is trying to do. So HTTP tries to be simple, stateless, um, and so on, whereas BitTrend is basically totally stateful. You have a lot of state going on inside a BitTrend client. Everything, everything is about this thing, that the more consumers we have, the more upstream bandwidth we have, and thus the more available bandwidth we have for distribution. And that is essentially what we, we're sacrificing everything to get this. Everything. Um, so what is the idea? This is BitTurned in one slide. I've given talks on BitTurned for some time now, and th I think that at last I have boiled BitTurned down to one slide. <laughs> so I know more or less what BitTurned is about. The goal is that we want to distribute an array of bytes that is essentially a file. Um, we want to do it in a concurrent way. So while we are fetching stuff from one party, we want to be pushing stuff to another party. Or we might actually be fetching stuff for, say, 10 parties and pushing stuff to five. And that's what, what often happens. The basic idea is very simple. We take the file, we split it into something called a piece. And each piece, we have a cryptographic checksum for, so we could do a, an, an integrity check on that part. So as soon as we get it, we can verify that we got the right part. So we have the array, split it into pieces, and now the game is to exchange the pieces. And there's an economy, there's an, a system about economy going on inside BitTurned that picks clever pieces to exchange all the time. So you're trying to optimize for piece exchange. And the way it works is essentially that you are doing uh, optimistic socializing. So all your friends you already know, you're going to shake hand with, hands with. And if there's a new guy that comes into the room you do not know, you try to shake hands with him a bit. And if he's a good guy and he is basically giving you stuff back, 
you're happy with him and he becomes one of your friends. But whenever there's somebody who is not giving you something back, you're going to boot the guy. That's essentially what, how the economy and the system works. There are two key points. One is that each peer, for each peer we have a state. And we keep that state in a process inside, um, inside eTurned. But the point is that we're really not caring about that state. If the process crashes, we lose the state, but that doesn't matter because the connection to the peer got uh, closed as well. So that state is not anymore valid. So we can basically crash all the processes in the system that pertains to peer communication. It's not important. The, the second key point is that what we do want to have on stable storage is as soon as a piece in, we download, a part of the turn we download passes an integrity check, so we know it's the right data, then we want it on stable storage as fast as possible. Because that means that when we restart, we can go through our stable storage, see what we already have, and start from there. So that, that basically is the two key points. Um, this is interesting. So if you really dig into what BitTurrent is, it turns out that BitTurrent is an asynchronous messaging protocol with a framing system on top of TCP. So it's basically just shoving back and forth Erlang terms. The protocol is different, but you could write it as a binary, a term to binary, binary to term, and send and receive of those over the line, where the TCP thing has a packet for uh, INET option set on it. That would be enough, essentially, to do it. The protocol is different, but parsing it and coding it and decoding it is about, yeah, 20 lines of, 20 lines of binary pattern matches, and that's it. Uh, a bit of history about eTurrent. It started a couple of years ago, um, and it, I worked on it on and off. I did courses at the local university. The first working version was about 2008. Um, it's about 8,000 lines of code. Um, you can do it with about 4,000, but we have more stuff in there, more extensions. So we are up at 8,000 lines at the moment. There are two main developers, me and Maunus, and he's here. <laughs> Um, and then we have a number of contributors uh, on the project as well um, who has contribu uh, made different contributions to the project. Um, so as I said, uh, the key components is that you're actually doing asynchronous messaging to the other peers and that fault tolerance and the stable storage is enough to actually, that those are the key points. And then the system is highly concurrent and since it's highly concurrent, it means that it's a really, really good fit for Erlang. So imagine that we have like two peers. One peer might be doing one thing. It might be handshaking with the other end in order to set up a connection, while the other peer over here is actually communicating I mean, with data. And we need to cope with that. And in Erlang, it's very easy because basically we just create two processes, right? Um, I have a philosophy about contributions to the project, which is that it's more important. So basically, the, con uh, the contributor is more important than the contribution. It's more important to get people on the project than it is that their contributions are right. So my basic philosophy is get in contributions to the project, push them to the master branch, and then try to fix them. Um, basically, the idea is that I'm trying to follow a saying by Linus Torvalds, which boils down to the idea that uh, you know that every programmer out there is clueless. Totally clueless. They are idiots, right? And by extension, it means that you yourself happens to be clueless and an idiot, right? Because you are a programmer on this project. So what is often the case is that what you want to do is that whenever somebody comes by, he usually has something you don't. And that means that you're interested in getting that knowledge that you do not have onto the project. And the best way to do that is to assume that you're the clueless guy and he actually has a clue, in which case the important thing is that you get out of the way so he can do work. So that's basically my f philosophy on, on leading projects. You basically have to get out of the way so people can do work on the project. Um, here is the uh, supervisor tree for eTurned. It isn't that scary, actually. 
uh, what we had is, so, so it's probably most easy to, easiest to describe if we go in here, because if we have a single torrent we want to download, there's a simple one for one supervisor here, maintaining a pool of peers. And the peers down here are actually free processes under a supervisor. There's, a, there's one that controls the thing, one that sends out stuff, and one that decodes re and receives stuff. So there's three down there in a little supervisor construction. Um, then we have, for each turn, we have an I.O. supervisor, and for that, that one has a number of supervisors for file I.O. So essentially there we are concerned, you might have more files in a turn file, so we basically have a process per file. And if you want some data in that process, you go to the file and ask it and say, I, or if you want data in the file, you go to the process that is associated with the file, and yeah, you ask that for the data. Um, and we have many of these. So for each turn, we have a tree like this. They are linked into a, a major turn pool here, which is the supervisor for all turns. And then there's some extra things around it, and there's actually more than this. But these things are basically bookkeeping processes. All of them maintains a, many of the ones up here, maintains a table of something and monitors other things. So it's basically just bookkeeping. Then we have the distributed, distributed hash table thing. There's a whole tree under there. I'm not drawing here. There's a listen supervisor for incoming connections. So we spawn them up here. Then we move them to the right turn when we know, basically with a controlling process call. So we move them from here down there, the, the connection. Uh, there is a way, so, so the tracker is, um, when you need to get peers and be turned, you go to a tracker, which is normally an HTTP call to a given system, and what you get back is you get back a list of peers that list the IP addresses, and those IP addresses are the peers you want to communicate with. So that's how you start. The, the, you have a file, which is the .turn file. That file contains a URL for the tracker, and how do you bootstrap it? Well, you go to that URL, get a list bunch of peers from the tracker, and then you are set to go. You can begin connecting to guys, handshaking, starting up the system. Well, the point is then that this tracker thing is actually not that fast when it's TCP and it's, it is HTTP. So what they did was they made an extension that allows you to do UDP tracking, that is tracking over UDP. And that part of the tree here is about handling that UDP tracker thing. So you're basically running a spe specialized protocol in UDP um, to get IP addresses you want to communicate with. Um, so some tricks. Uh, we are about as fast as the C clients if you load the system with a couple of turns. So if you load with a single turn, the C clients tends to beat us by quite much. But load some more turns in there so we get the concurrency up and this system actually begins to perform really, really well. And at a certain point, we hit criticality in the sense that we are better. And the way we do it is that we fight unfair. So basically the first thing we do is we, of course, search for the good algorithm. Um, and we can do that basically because we are writing things in Erlang, so we are not set in stone. A lot of the clients, the C clients, are actually doing brute force searches on the arrays because it's too hard for them to change the, um, their internal representation in the code. And it is very, very easy for us to do because it's Erlang, so we have that freedom. It's very often possible to fight unfair by changing the algorithm. Um, the second thing we do is we use heuristics a lot. So rather than going for the optimal algorithm, we look at the probability of a given path in the code being hit. And then we basically optimize our code paths on such that the common path is the fastest one. And then we have a lot of other paths, but they might be slow, we don't care because we hit them rarely, right? Um, so a common trick, for instance, is that we have a lot of statistics going on in the system. Each peer is storing statistics in an edge table. And then when you want to, for instance, look at how, how, what is our, user, our current bandwidth use, we'll just do a match on the whole table and aggregate it down to a value. But we guess that that is a rare thing to do compared to the thing of updating the statistics because that's something our peers are going to do all the time. So we do a lot of those kinds of things. Um, another trick we use a lot is that 
we do a lot of approximations. So rather than going for the rather than going for the optimal solution, we go for a suboptimal but near optimal uh, solution to the problem. So there's a lot of places where good enough cuts it. Um, I think Jay Dumark did some talk about that yesterday, perhaps. But the basic idea is that, say, for instance, you have a priority queue. Uh, it's not always the case that you are interested in this has priority 6 and this has priority 7. What you're interested in is that these two things have low priority and they have priority lower than this bunch of things. So it's actually not, it's not precisely a given priority you are worried about. You are worried about a rough ballpark of what kind, is this a high priority or low priority thing? And by playing with that idea, you can actually do a lot of optimizations because you are more loose in your definitions and that opens up the path for more efficient algorithms. Um, so I was basically going to talk about new stuff. And the interesting new stuff that is going on inside BitTorrent is that I built a micro TP protocol prototype. Um, so my TP is essentially a TCP implementation. It's a uh, it's a variant of TCP, and BitTorrent clients uses it. And I thought it was would be fun to look at. Uh, well, let's build a TCP implementation or a TCP variant implementation in, in Erlang. Um, it's interesting to discuss why they are using it, um, or why they are they are going that way. Why build your own variant of TCP, and do all the hassle of doing that? Uh, that's interesting, and it turns out that it has to do with the with buffers in, in networks. Uh, Scott Fritchie had a thing about TCP incast a couple of months ago. The basic idea here is that no buffers is a problem. So suppose you have a switch, suppose that multiple ports access the same port on the switch, then you will have a collision on that port. And that collision will lead to retransmits on the port meaning that TCP would say, see this, um, TCP would see a drop packet and it would say, oh, I have a congestion situation, so I have to turn down the speed by which I'm communicating. Um, by adding a small buffer, you fix that problem, because now things get buffered up and then you basically weave in these multiple packets that arrive at the same time on the port. But it turns out that Jim Gettys has the opposite thing uh, in observation, that if you have two large buffers, that's a problem as well. So a modern router on the network usually have like one gigabyte of, of buffer space. I'm not kidding you. It's about one gigabyte of buffer space. So what happens is if you have a high bandwidth line and you end up add a packet to it, what really happens is that this high bandwidth line will, will the packet will enter the buffer, right? And it'll stay in the buffer for a very, for a very long time before it gets decued in the other end. And that messes with latency, because now if the, if the buffer is, is almost empty and I end a packet, there'll be no latency. Whereas if the buffer is almost most full and I put in a packet to it, it has to live in the buffer until it's, the buffer is a queue, right? So it has to live in the queue until it, it, it gets dequeued. So the latency is much higher. And that means that we're messing a lot with latency. And as, imagine that you have a typical line uh, at home you have a, a, a router, an ADSL modem, or a cable modem. Their, their buffer is usually about around eight packets, which is really, really low. Um, and basically, all these kinds of trouble will mess with latency. You will have buffers on each hop on the way towards your peer. This gives you a lot of latency problems. The problem is, essentially, that TCP uses packet loss to detect congestion. So when a packet gets queued in these latency buffers on the, on the way, we get into the trouble where when we get the packet losses, when one of the buffers in there is full, and that's too late. Because we've been turning up speed all the time because, yeah, we have this product bandwidth delay. It looks fine. We can just turn up the speed a bit all the time. So this is called buffer bloat or dark buffers. Uh, and it was identified about a year ago by Jim Gettys. Um, MicroTP's idea is write a TCP variant that measures latency on the line. So basically, we're measuring how long time does it get to reach the endpoint. 
and then have a target latency like 100 milliseconds. And whenever we go above, whenever it happens to be the case that we send out a packet and we go above that target latency, we'll turn down the rate by which we are sending. And of course, if we are under the target latency, we will send packets faster. So basically, we are trying to target a specific latency. And the idea here is that then you can run your BitTorrent client at full speed and still have an, HSA, in, an SSH session that works. Um, or you can run your TCP client at full speed and still have a Skype call working next beside it. Um, so that's the basic idea of why we are doing this. And it's fun to see how can you implement this idea in Erlang. Um, it turns out that there's very little documentation. There's a C++ reference implementation, though. Contains one object. The object has like 60 fields. Um, so the reverse engineering starts to figure out what to do about that, because you won't, you won't, you won't want a state record in Erlang with 60 fields. That just sounds bad. So the key point here, I think, I, the, the, my key conclusion was that C++ code is control flow oriented in the way that you write statements. Whereas Erlang code tend to be data flow oriented because you are telling the system how to manipulate data from one state to another. So the idea is basically to change the code such that from a control flow oriented way into a data flow oriented way and as soon as you get that model right, things should just pop out in the right order, essentially. So here is the first kind of idea I got. We have the stack in the middle, and we begin looking at what kinds of events can happen in this system. So there's an internet. It can send us packets, or we can send packets to it. There's a timer. With that can trigger timer events to the stack. And there are clients inside the system that will do a send or receive on a given uh, MyTP socket. So this basically says that there's only a few events that can manipulate the stack. And those events are the ones we are interested in. If we can write a system that are, happens to be based on exactly those events and reacts whenever one of the such events happens, then we're basically done. We, we, then we have a good model. Um, there are two key insights then. The f first one is, of course, find the right process split. Find the, the right processes to have in your system in order to do this. And the second key insight is that given a process, it will have a record with a state. And if we can find the right way to split that state up into substates such that it makes sense whenever you operate on it, then you have a really good model. So these two are probably the two main key insights. Um, here is the supervisor tree for, for the beast. Um, it turns out that what you need is that um, actually this guy here is the main guy. When you call send or receive, you, you go in here. Um, the idea is that packets from the outside, from the internet, will come in here, get to the decoder, be decoded, and then dispatched to one of the workers. A worker here represents a socket. So each worker down here in the pool happens to be a socket. The pit of that is actually the socket that a client will use. So if a client wants to hear out here want to send something, it'll have the pit directly into the worker here that allows it to send things. Each worker is basically just a GenFSM. And like TCP, you have all these kind of states where you can be uh, Establish, you can be listening, you can accept, you can establish a connection, you can be in a fin state, you can be in so on. All these states you know from TCP basically exist there. And each of those becomes a state in the GenFSM. So the tracer up here is a trick. Um, essentially, I have a separate process that allows me to do runtime tracing of the system. So I can do event tracing of what is happening and I can then look at the event traces and see if my protocol works correctly. So that is the reason for the tracer. Normally, it is disabled, so it has a call. You call the tracer, and there is a return in there which just says, hopefully, trace. That's the atom you get back. But then you can use the runtime system in Erlang to attach a real debugging tracer to that, and then you can get out information. So there's a dummy function 
I use as a probe in there in order to get tracing of the system when I want it. For the state in, so we have workers here. So the state in a worker looks like this. It turns out that what makes sense is to say we have a major state and it contains three parts. So the process part is basically an incoming outgoing buffer queue. The idea is that if you are a process that want to send on this socket, you end up in a queue there until you are allowed to send. If you want to receive, say, 24 bytes, you end up in here in a queue until you want to receive or until there's 24 bytes ready. And the basic idea is that I can put this in a separate process or in a separate module. So I can put this in a separate module. And that makes it a lot easier because whenever I want to do process management, I just call to that module. That's a nice abstraction. The buffer over here has to do with the uh, reorder buffer for incoming packets. So whenever a packet is incoming, I place it over there in a reorder buffer. Um, the buffer over there also has to do with retransmissions. So if you want to retransmit a packet, it's in there in the buffer construction somewhere. And you can just ask the buffer, I want to have packet number 24. And it'll hand it back to you. Again, it's a separate module. So basically, this is the module split I figured out was the best one. The socket is down here, but it is wrapped in a network. And the network part contains all the windows of the system. So like TCP, we have sliding windows. So the network part here knows how big the sliding window is, can change the size of the sliding window, and so on and so forth. Um, it turns out that, that this model is act brings the best code. In the beginning, I had everything in the state, and that didn't work. It was simply too hard to figure out what was going on. So I began fiddling with this kind of split, and I ended up at this split. And I think it's OK um, for most of the code. Um, then we have uh, a little final key inside. So there is this concept known, uh, named Boolean blindness. Is there anyone who knows about that? No. OK, so the idea of Boolean blindness is that Booleans are the scorch of programming. They're really, really bad. Hate them with a passion. Um, the problem is that if we have E here, E is some expression, and we compute E to true, we have no evidence why E was true, right? We know, we know that E has, is some computation that ended up in true. But we do not know why, because the computation we threw out. So along the way in that computation, there might have been a clue to why. Say E was a conjunction between A and B. So it was A and B, right? We might want to know that. We might be able to ask, why was it true? Yeah, because we had A and B, and both were true, right? That's kind of a, a, a description of why, um, why this is true. And it has to do with the fact that a Boolean is data, but it is not a proposition, a, a, a part of a proof. So what happens is that whenever we compute something to true, we lose the evidence. And that means that true carries no additional meaning. Right? We have a value true. Why is it true? We don't know as programmers. We, we have to look in the context of the code to understand what true means. And more importantly, um, true is no proof. It isn't a proof of something. It's just a simple bit, a one-bit value. And that means that whenever we see Booleans in code, we should be worried. And here comes the example for why. Um, this one is basically equivalent to this one. right? Up here, we are asking for the length of a list we equal with 0. If it's true, we do something. If it's false, well, then the length of the list must be greater than 0. So there must be a head we can project out of the list, right? And there must be a tail we can project out of the list. And I hope that everyone agrees that this is kind of like bad code. No Erlang programmer should write this. They should prefer stuff like this down here, where you say, OK, we have a list. The list has a structure. So we can case split on that structure. And what we learn is essentially that if the structure is empty, we would have nothing bound here. But if the structure is, consists of a console that has a head and a tail, head and tail will be bound in the body and we can use it, right? Um, 
in a certain way, this is better than this one because up here, we didn't learn anything when it was true. We didn't learn anything when it was false. We have to reconstruct the information that there is a head of a list and there is a tail of a list. Um, so what I try to do in the code is I try to avoid this kind of situation where we have boole booleans because whenever you see it in, a, in code, you might actually be coding this very situation, right? It might be that you're writing up code that is this just in a disguise. So be worried about the booleans. That's essentially the message. Um, the idea is essentially that you want to rather do it like this. You want to write some kind of analyzer function that returns a term or a data type that does some analysis of the, of the thing. And the analysis should provide some kind of evidence for what happened. And then you case split on with some kind of executor. You case split on that analysis and do things based on that analysis. Hopefully, this means that your code will have much less analysis based on, is this true and false? Is this true and false? Is this true and false? You will have much less if mazes in your code base, or case mazes in the case of, of Erlang. It splits the concerns, so you have a simple concern, and you do not have to recompute the evidence of why something was true. So here is a very simple example from the code. Um, Essentially, we want to handle a receive of a packet. The packet has a sequence number, a payload. We have a buffer, a packet buffer, and we have a state. This update receive buffer call here is the analyzer. It'll go in with the sequence number of the payload. It'll scrutinize the packet buffer, and it'll give us one out of three possibilities. Either it'll say, the packet is a duplicate, in which case we can basically just return the packet buffer and we tell this is a prop list that will tell the, the upper levels of the system that we want to act this. We can get OK buffer with a new buffer, so that means the packet was absorbed into the buffer, in which case we return the new buffer and we consider that we might want to send an act, but that's not necessarily true. It might be that we have a delayed act going on. So it might not be the case that we want to send, send it right away in this case. There, uh, henceforth, the um, consider send back. And the last possibility is that we might get a fin packet in here and a buffer, in which case we also want to say, then we want the act as fast as possible, but we also want to tell the, the levels above in the system that we got a fin packet. So I hope you can see the idea here is that update receive buffer is the analyzer that goes in and scrutinizes a lot of data and returns a term here, either duplicate OK buffer or Godfin buffer, which we can then execute on. We could have written it with a lot of true false if mazes, right? We could have written, we could have ri written a lot of things that, that would go in and analyze, but basically we have hidden those parts and we have simplified those parts away from the main code. So it's in there somewhere. But usually, we can, we can avoid having true and false in the code by thinking about this. So the main part of the code has no occurrence of basically booleans. And I, I've been using this a lot uh, in my code bases now. And it, it turns out to be really interesting. And it's a really cool way to write it. Um, so the current state is something like this. It works. We have about 80% implemented of the guy. Um, what we're missing is selective acts uh, and other small stuff. It has been tested over the internet. It has been tested with uh, NetEM, which is a Linux kernel module you load. And then it can, it'll basically mess up your connection. So it'll say, uh, you can say to it, I want to reorder 80% uh, of the packets. I want 3% duplicates. I want to have a 4% packet loss. And it'll just simulate that for you. So when you're sending and receiving packets, raw packets on the line, you're basically getting messed up. And then you can check that your system, because you're implementing a TCP connection, right? So you need to be sure that it is reliable. And hence, the idea here is that you can use NetEM to check that you actually are uh, doing the right thing uh, with respect to reliability. It cannot talk with the reference implementation yet, because it needs selective acts to do that. Um, so that's kind of the negative uh, at the moment. And that's about it. The code is on GitHub. There is a MyTP 
uh, branch down there if you want to look at the MyTB code. Um, yeah, that's about it. Any questions? Yeah, you yeah. mentioned that you cannot communicate with the reference implementation of UTP. Is there any other implementation that you're able to communicate to, or is ETOR and basically having a protocol that you cannot use? Well, at the moment, the problem is that there are two implementations out there. The reference implementation, right, and this. Okay. That's it. There's only two possible imp implementations. And I think that the ref ref implementation is so hard to uh, understand for many people that they are not going to use it. Mm -hmm. um, this protocol lacks documentation. The documentation is basically, it's like TCP, but. And it's not like TCP when you begin digging into it. Then the small things that are different. For instance, TCP allows you to have what is called half-open connections. So you actually have to close the connection in both directions. This protocol does not. If you close in one direction, the other direction automatically closes. And it gives all kinds of nasty problems, actually. So it's, it isn't, it isn't <laughs> when, when you begin digging into it, it turns out that, that it isn't just TCP but, right? Are there any other questions? So do you, do you support uh, magnetized uh, transfers as well? Huh? Do you support magnetized transfers? Magnet links, you think? Yeah. yeah. Not yet. My guess is that it would be a around 30 lines of code or something okay. like that to fix. Um, you need the distributed hash table stuff. We have that. Okay. So the only thing you need to do is you need to ask the distributed hash table uh, for a lookup. And then you should basically have the turn and be able to run, uh, more or less. So around 30 lines of code is my guess. Yeah? Are there any or like there is, actually. Um, it turns out that what it is used for is to distribute stuff uh, inside server farms. So you have, so imagine you have 1,000 uh, PCs or 1,000 machines, and you have a, a PHP thing, say, and you pack up everything into a tarball, and that tarball is one gigabyte in size. Now you want to distribute that as quickly as possible in a deployment scheme to these 1,000 machines. It turns out BitTorrent is a very good way to do that because you're maximizing the bandwidth in your uh, backbone network. And it has been used for that. I know that. <laughs> and that's a good major use of it. Uh, quick distribution of, of deployment. Yeah. So one other question. Do you think that the micro OTP, since it's not, it's not well documented, it does sort of strange things, mm -hmm. do you think it's going to get adopted? It is adopted in, in some clients, actually. Um, the official mainstream, mainline client has it and uses it. And around, so the reason I began studying it was because around, I, I figured that around about 10% of all traffic on the internet uses this protocol wow. for that reference implementation. And nobody knows what it does, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> That was the reason for why I began studying it. The other interesting thing is that the latency handling is what is called LEDBAT, if you know about that. So you might know Vegas and Reno and Cubic, these congestion, congestion algorithms. LEDBAT is a variant of that, that looks at latency. And this protocol uses it. Uh, and all these things that Jim Gettys started with buffer bloat and stuff like that, uh, it's probably going to be active queue management that solves that. But it's fun to look into other ways of doing it because you might not end up going the active queue management way because essentially that carriers are not interested in that, right? There's no interest in making Skype work better than it does right now. No, nobody is interested in doing that. They would much rather have that you cannot upload an image while Skyping. Right. That's much better because that gives a worse product and you're going, to be, you're going to take your mobile phone and call instead of over something else. Right? That's exactly what they want. So if you take that kind of path, this is important as I see it because it's research that opens up the way to solve this kind of thing in the long run if active queue management does not uh, get uh, there. Yes. All right, thank you very much.